All right, the purpose of this talk is to go over Chapter 11, the things that maybe we didn't go over as much or some new things that are in Chapter 11 about solutions before we start on Chapter 12 tomorrow. So we're just kind of cruising through some of these things where we've seen some of it before. Chapter 12 will be all brand new. All right, so here we go. First of all, let's just review the steps of dissolving. So we have a solute needs to break apart, so it's broken apart, energy in. A solvent needs to break apart, energy in. And now the solute and solvent get together to form a solution. Energy is then released. So here's a couple examples of that. So here's delta H1, solute breaks apart, solvent breaks apart, energy in. Here's the energy released. And then the total overall energy of the solution would be energy released, and this would be an example of an exothermic um, solution. Here we have a certain amount of energy in, but there's less energy coming out when a solution is formed, so there's more energy going in overall, so it's being endothermic solution. We did some of that in regular chem where the solutions got hot, when the solutions got cold, this is a cold pack, those instant cold packs would work like this, where you're, they're mixing ammonium nitrate with water, and overall there's energy going in to breaking apart bonds, so um, the water gets cold. The energy comes out of the water. All right, let's talk about other factors or some factors affecting solubility besides the fact that they can get hot or cold. Pressure effects. Henry's Law. So there's some things we haven't seen before. We just talked about in regular chemistry about how we increase the pressure above a solution. It increases the concentration, how much gas can dissolve. So we kind of, we talked about how pop is bottled under very high pressure because we're pushing the carbon dioxide into the solution because it doesn't dissolve very well at normal pressures. So that they put it, that they bottle it under high pressures. All right, K is a constant depending on which gas we're talking about and P is the pressure above that solution. So as you can see it's a direct proportion. As the pressure goes up the concentration is going to go up and it's just a way to put math to the whole Henry's Law that we've seen before. So as we increase the pressure, the concentration of the gas dissolved is going to increase, and vice versa. If we decrease the pressure, it will decrease. Just like when you open up the top, um, you are decreasing the pressure above that soda, so the carbon dioxide is constantly leaving, then makes your pop flat. You can kind of take a look at these examples. It's when you have higher pressure, it kind of forces the molecules, the gas molecules, to stay in the solution. All right, what about temperature? As you know, most solids are increased with temperature, but not always. It's pretty difficult to predict. So you can't always assume that solids are going to be more soluble with increased temperature, but a lot of times they will be. Um, gases typically decrease. So here's some solids. For the most part, they're increasing, but there's also these other two, sodium sulfate, cerium sulfate, cesium sulfate, that do decrease. So it's kind of kind of weird. Actually, it is cerium sulfate. Sorry, not cesium. So they do decrease with temperature. Tough to predict. Gases pretty much are always going to decrease with temperature. As they move faster, they're able to break any bonds they have in the, in the uh, solution quite easily, and they leave the solution. All right, so it's just kind of describing what happens when you have a solute in a solution. It makes it more difficult for these solvent particles to leave um, the solution and become a gas, so it lowers the vapor pressure because of that. So there is a new thing, again, math that goes with it. We talked about this in regular chem, but we never put math to it. And this is called Raoult's Law. So we have a little bit, a couple things that are new. You'll see this on your green sheet. Green sheet. So if you take out your green sheet, you'll see this. It doesn't say Raoult's Law, but it says P A here. They say P A, not, not of the solution, on your green sheet equals P total times 
times xA. And then xA is what is called the mole fraction, as you'll see on the next thing, which is the moles of any solute A over the total moles overall. That's called a mole, a mole fraction. So let's just say we had two moles of A over four total moles. The mole fraction would be 0.5 in that case. Just an example. So again, this is relating the concentration to what's going to actually happen to the vapor pressure. It is putting numbers to what we've talked about before. So the pressure of the solution, or the pressure with the A in it, is a mole fraction of the solvent. So not the, not the, uh, not the solute. So the mole fraction of the solvent, which makes sense. Because if it's only pure solvent, so then the mole fraction is going to be 1. This will be 1. So I'd expect the, the pressure of my solvent to be very be exactly the same because nothing's dissolved in it. If it's 0 0.99, well, it's going to be really close to its normal vapor pressure. So it's the mole fraction of the solvent, not the solute. I may have misspoke. Vapor pressure of the pure solvent is what you're seeing here. What would it be with nothing dissolved in it? So you can see here how that vapor pressure um, changes. If the mole fraction is 1, it goes down to 0, then the pressure is going to go down to 0. All right. If there's two liquids put in and they're both volatile, then we have a different modified Wells law, and that is just where you'd add up the, the new pressures of each of them. That's it. Each of those will act ideally as one of them would, would approach 0 or 1. Not something that you'll uh, need to worry about in this class. Collider properties. This is something, again, we did in, in regular chemistry, talking about how when we add substances to water or any solvent, we change the boiling point. We always increase the boiling point. We always decrease the freezing point. The phase diagram actually go, undergoes a change when you make a solution rather than that pure substance. So colligator property is something that depends on the number, not on the identity, even though it kind of does, which we'll see later, of the solute particles. So you should be able to use any substance in, um, in water. If you dissolve any substance, it shouldn't matter what it is, it will decrease the freezing point, increase the boiling point. Also will affect osmotic pressure, which we will talk about here shortly. Boiling point. So it always elevates the boiling point. It the formula we use in regular chem is the change of temperature boiling equals Kb, which is a constant for all solvents have their own constant. And then the molality, or the concentration of the solute. Remember what molality is, which is moles, again, this is on your green sheet, moles of solute. And it actually says on your green sheet, per kilogram solvent doesn't put it into a regular equation, but that's on your green sheet. So be aware of the things that are on your green sheet, what you have to use. Freezing point is the same exact um, formula, but instead it's got Kf, which is a different constant. So for instance, for water, Kf is 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal. Kb, the boiling point constant, is 0.51. So they're different for water. They're different for all substances. So you have to make sure you're using the correct constant, but that will definitely be given to you. So just be aware of what you're using and what you're doing. So what's osmotic pressure? Well, osmosis is when you have solvent flowing through a membrane. You probably remember this from biology. So we're now, again, putting a formula to it. We have osmotic pressure, which is measured in atmospheres. M is the molarity of the solution, so the concentration. R is the gas law constant. And we're going to have to use 0.0821 because of the atmospheres. And the temperature is going to be in Kelvin. So what does osmosis look like? Well, you have a solution like this. And we have a solvent. And we have this membrane where the solvent can travel through. Well, since there's solute in here, the solvent will go from lowest concentration to highest concentration to try to even it out. And it goes into here, as you see here. And it's making the level of the water go up. It gets up to the point where... Um, it's at equilibrium, where there's equal amounts going in and equal amounts coming out. 
And that height difference between the water is called the osmotic pressure. Here's another way of looking. Cultural migrate through the membrane from the solution of low concentration to the solution of high concentration. A concentrated glucose solution is added to an inverted funnel in the thinnest permeable membrane, and the funnel is placed in a beaker of pure water. Water flows from the beaker into the funnel. The upward flow of water stops, and the pressure of the solution above the membrane equals the osmotic pressure of five. All right. Another way of looking at that. Here's the semipermeable membrane. Here's where they're equal, and then we first mix them. And then once, the, once we have equilibrium of uh, solvent particles going back and forth the same amount, this difference in height here is called the osmotic pressure. That's the osmotic pressure. You ever uh, heard of reverse osmosis? That is when you are putting pressure on it here. That's why it's reverse osmosis. And it's a way to purify water. And what you're doing is you are, as you're putting pressure here, you're forcing these solvent particles to go through the membrane, but notice what's happening. Only the solvent particles go through, and all this other stuff that's dissolved stays on this side. So this is pure water if you do a reverse osmosis. All right. So let's solve this problem. We have osmotic pressure equals molarity times R times C. All right, the only thing we don't know here is our molarity. So I'm going to solve for molarity, which is going to be the osmotic pressure divided by RT. I'm going to have to change that to atmosphere, so 558 divided by 750, because a tor is just like a millimeter mercury. That would give me 0.734. I'd carry that through in my calculator, but 0.734 atmospheres divided by R, 0.0821, and divided by 298, because that has to be in Kelvin. So I'm going to put that in my calculator. I get 0 0.03, 0, 0, a bunch of zeros. So looks like I have two I can use, and that's molar. So that's the molarity of the solution. Now, how can I get to the molar mass? Ooh, I need grams per mole. Well, I have grams right here, and I have molarity, which is moles over liters. So if I take that times 10.0 milliliters, that will give me 0.3 millimoles of this compound. Now I can take, to get the molar mass, 33.4 milligrams divided by 0.3 millimoles. And now the millis will just cancel out, and I'll have an answer in grams per mole. 33.4 divided by 0.3 gives me 111 grams per mole for this substance. So good little problem solving there for osmotic pressure. All right, what about when there's electrolytes? What about if they're dividing into more than one thing when you dissolve them in water. Well, that's called the Von Hoff factor. It's the relationship between the moles of solute and the moles of particles, um, and that's with the I. So, depends how many particles is dissolved divided by the moles of the solute dissolved. So what does that mean? Well, we're getting there. So, the given instance, small percentage of sodium chloride, for instance, are counting as a single pair. So it doesn't actually go exactly like you expect. It's not exactly twice the effect because of that. But we can figure out the expected value of this I, assuming that none of the ion pairing occurs at all. So for instance, NaCl splits into 1 Na and 1 Cl, so I, the von Hoff factor, would be 2. KNO3, 1K, 1NO3, 2 again. Na3PO4, 3 sodiums, 1 phosphate, 4. It's most important in concentrated solutions because there's more ions there. Um, as they dilute, they get further apart, and there's less chance for them to find each other. But it does occur at some, some point for all of them. And the bigger the charges, the more they're going to find each other. So how do we modify? You might notice on your green sheet you have some modified um, formulas. 
And what do they look like on your green sheet? Well, if we look at your green sheet, we have delta TF equals K, whoops, I, KF, and then it actually says times molality. So this is the von Toth factor. If you're talking about a, um, say, NaCl, that would be 2. If you're talking about sugar, that'd be 1. You wouldn't deal with it at all because it's not ionic. It's a molecule. So on your formula sheet, you have delta TB equals IKB times molality. That is how this formula is adjusted. And you also have how the osmotic pressure is adjusted, where you put IMRT, because it'll also have the same effect, because it's a collective property. So you're going to have some things to work on now, some practice problems that will apply this information. Good luck. Have fun.